The superheterodyne method is where two signals are mixed together to make a lower frequency signal that is easier to deal with. And according to Wikipedia, virtually all modern radio receivers use the superheterodyne principle. But how was it invented? How does it work? And what does that have to do with how radio became so popular? This is the story of Howard Armstrong, who invented it in the middle of a bombing raid, and David Sarnoff, who used Armstrong's invention to fulfill his improbable desire to make a broadcast empire with himself at the helm. Ready for the story? Let's go! Electricity, 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 electricity. Let's start with David Sarnoff. Sarnoff was born in a shtetl in Minsk, Russia in 1891 to a poor Jewish painter. Think Fiddler on the Roof, but with a painter. When Sarnoff was just a boy, his father left Russia to go to America to improve their fortunes. But when Sarnoff, his mother, and younger brothers joined him in New York, Sarnoff found that his father was unable to care for anyone. At the tender age of nine, Sarnoff became the breadwinner for the family. Years later, he recalled that, quote, it was like being tossed into a whirlpool, a slum whirlpool, and left to sink or swim. Sarnoff's interest in wireless began when he started delivering telegraphs for the commercial cable company. He was actually looking for a job with the New York Herald, but he opened the wrong door. Sarnoff then spent a precious $2 out of his $5 a week paycheck to purchase a telegraph key, and he then taught himself how to be a telegraph operator. Soon he switched to working for the Marconi Company, where he was occasionally allowed to send wireless messages when the main operators were sick. One day in December of 1906, Guillermo Marconi himself visited his New York office, and the bold 15-year-old introduced himself to the big boss. They had an instant rapport, and at the end of the evening, Sarnoff became Marconi's personal New York messenger boy, which mostly involved deliveries to Marconi's many mistresses. With Marconi's patronage, Sarnoff became a junior telegraph operator. He moved up to being a local manager by 1912, when the Titanic sank. Sarnoff then created a story where he was the first to hear of it in the United States. He wasn't. That he was the only operator working. He wasn't. And that he stayed up for three nights straight to hear the news. Maybe. Due to his heroics, he was promoted to chief inspector and right-hand man to the general manager, Edward J. Nally. The next year in 1913, the 21-year-old Sarnoff went to a demonstration from a wonder kid named Howard Armstrong, who had figured out how to make triode vacuum tubes create smooth radio waves and amplify signals up to 5,000 times more powerfully than before. Sarnoff then invited Armstrong to demonstrate his device at one of the Marconi Company's tower, and they spent 13 hours straight in a frigid shack receiving signals from around the world. Years later, Sarnoff said, whatever chills the air produced were more than extinguished by the warmth of the thrill which came at me at hearing for the first time signals from across the Atlantic and across the Pacific. Sarnoff tried to get the Marconi Company to buy the patent, but they refused possibly because they were in patent litigation with the original inventor of the vacuum triode. Sarnoff and Armstrong were disappointed, but they remained friends. Two years later, Sarnoff sent his boss a proposition. I have in mind a plan of development which would make radio a household utility in the same sense as the piano. Nally was interested, but the higher-ups thought it was too radical, so that too came to nothing at the time. In April of 1917, America joined World War I and Sarnoff attempted to volunteer for the Navy, but was denied because his job was vital to the war effort, or as Sarnoff thought, because of anti-Semitism. Meanwhile, Howard Armstrong volunteered for the Army and was stationed in Paris working on radio systems. In Europe, Armstrong heard that the Germans were using very high-frequency waves, but he didn't know how they were doing it as radio waves at the time did not work well above about 500 kilohertz. Months later, Armstrong was watching a night bombing raid in Paris, and he started thinking about the high-frequency radio waves produced by the motor ignition systems in the airplanes. He wondered what would happen if he combined them with the high-frequency radio waves he could create in a receiver. 
Suddenly he had a radical solution to the high frequency problem. He knew that if two waves were combined with slightly different frequencies, then they produced a beat frequency. You might have heard this phenomenon if you've ever tried to tune a guitar without a tuner. When you make two notes that are slightly different frequency, the result is a womp womp sound. Armstrong realized he could use this method to make low frequency waves out of high frequency ones. This wasn't actually a completely new idea. In 1905, a man named Reginald Fezzedin had patented his plan to mix two signals so that the beat frequency was audible and you could hear it on headphones. Fezzedin called it the heterodyne method, hetero for two different, dyne for force. Armstrong's insight was to combine signals to produce radio waves that were manageable, but were still above hearing or supersonic. For that reason, Armstrong called his idea the super heterodyne method. And if you look into a schematic of it, the basic idea is still the same. You take a radio signal and mix it with another signal at a slightly different frequency, producing the beat frequency or the intermediate frequency. One of the advantages of the super heterodyne method is that you can set it up so the intermediate frequency is constant for any radio station you're listening to. That way the bulk of your equipment is optimized to amplify that set frequency. Armstrong built a working system, but it was too big and complicated for commercial use. When the war ended in 1919, Sarnoff's boss created a brand new company with the idea of keeping all radio communication in the hands of Americans. For this reason, he called it the Radio Corporation of America, or RCA. After a few years of wrangling, RCA managed to get the patents for basically everything to do with radio, over 2,000 patents. Now Sarnoff could implement his scheme to make radio a household utility. Meanwhile, between 1920 and 1922, Armstrong received a whopping $735,000 in cash and 60,000 shares of RCA stock, making Armstrong RCA's biggest stockholder for his patents, even the ones that didn't end up working out that well. In addition, he also met Sarnoff's secretary, Marion McGuinness, and fell in love. In February of 1923, Armstrong demonstrated a simplified version of his super heterodyne method for Sarnoff, and Sarnoff scrapped millions of dollars of past orders to make all of their radio equipment super heterodyne. Still, this original plan wasn't working for mass-produced systems. Finally, the exacerbated Sarnoff said, what do I do? To which Marion said, why don't you call in Armstrong? Armstrong swooped in and with an army friend of his named Harry Hook, saved the day. By February of 1924, RCA finally had its super heterodyne receivers, including the Radiola AR812, the Rolls Royce of radio, which only needed three controls. So how do the Radiola's controls work? Well, in the early radios, they used an adjustable capacitor, where if you turned a knob, more or less metal was put in parallel with each other, which changed how much charge it can hold. If a capacitor is discharged through a coil, it vibrates at a certain frequency. So by adjusting the capacitor, you're changing the frequency of oscillation. The first knob changed the capacitance of one capacitor, which controlled the frequency of resonance with the antenna. In other words, it controlled which frequency radio station you were listening to. The second knob controlled the frequency of the oscillations that you were mixing with the incoming signal, once again by adjusting the capacitor. You would tune this until the beat frequency, or the intermediate frequency, was at a note that the rest of the electronics was maximized for, around 45 kilohertz. The final knob was for the volume. The radiola used six vacuum triodes, and you adjusted the volume by changing the resistance of a resistor next to a battery that was heating the filament of the triodes. The idea is, if you lower the resistance, then the current through the filament increases, which heats the filament more. As the filament gets hotter, more electrons can flow from the filament, which increases the volume in the headphones. Woo! After that, RCA basically had a monopoly on radio. Sarnoff then formed America's first broadcasting network, NBC, one of the big five studios, RKO Pictures, 
and reigned as the president of RCA and boss of radio, movie, and the television world until he retired in 1970 when he was 79 years old. Meanwhile, back in 1924, Howard Armstrong was rewarded with another 20,000 shares of RCA stock, and Armstrong wrote Harry Hook a personal check for $100,000. To give you a sense of how much that was, the average income in 1924 was $3,400. Howard Armstrong celebrated by climbing the top of RCA's 400-foot tower and doing insane acrobatics to show off for Marion. Sarnoff Crossley wrote, if you have made up your mind that this mundane universe of ours is not a suitable place for you to be spending your time in, I don't want to quarrel with your decision, but keep away from the property of Radio Corporation. Armstrong didn't care. He was wealthy, famous, and most importantly, Marion had finally agreed to marry him. Armstrong was literally and figuratively on the top of the world, which meant there was only one way to go. And unfortunately, Sarnoff was a large part of his downfall. How Armstrong invented FM radio, and it was so amazing that it destroyed his relationship with Sarnoff and eventually his life, is next time on The Secret History of Electricity. Electricity, 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 electricity. Thanks for watching my video. Please remember to give it a thumbs up. Also remember to subscribe. And if you have any questions, please put it on the bottom and I'll try my best to answer them. Also, if you're interested in more history about Howard Armstrong, Reginald Fesedin, or Marconi, please look on the end of the video and I will include links. Okay, have a nice day.